Hi, I'm Marilyn Hamilton, and I'm the founder of Integral City Meshworks. And I've been really interested to see what's happening in the world as uh, the whole set of crises that started with climate change and then went into COVID and gone on into the war, um, how people are actually coping. I live in Findhorn in the Eco Village in the park, and there's some wonderful experiences that I've had over the last two and a half years that have helped me. And I, I would say from my Integral City perspectives, I would call them culture. You know, some people who talk about cities and organizations say culture can eat strategy for lunch. And I think that is true. And one of the people who has inspired me is who I am interviewing today, and that is Laura Passetti. Laura, you come to Fintorn from a different place in the world. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your background? Thank you, Marilyn. I came to Findon for the first time in 1994 for Experience Week with the Findon Foundation. And I was just after acting school at the time and starting my career as an actress and a director in theater. So that is my background. I completely fell in love with Findon and with the uh, principles of Findon and uh, to the point that I really wanted to just abandon my my career and come to live in Findon and become a member of the Findon Foundation. Uh, but I actually then uh, make the decision to um, to continue my career. So I came to Findon on and off since 1994, usually spending a few times in Italy and few time in Findon. So I'm originally from Italy. I've been in the theater industry for the, for the last 35 years initially as an actress and director, and then I moved completely into directing and playwright, and um, and now coaching and using theatre in a different way. Thank you, Laura. Yes, it's really intriguing to hear that you would come to Fintorn, and many people would say, wow, Fintorn over Italy, they would choose it the other way around. But I'm I'm delighted to learn a little bit more about your background because you know, theater was always my own original calling. So to meet somebody who stuck with that and found that not only has, I think it been rewarding for you, but I think you've discovered four ways that you can bring it, bring that part of yourself to Findhorn as well as taking Findhorn out into the world. Would that be fair to say? Yes, yes, absolutely. I think, you know, for many years I was, questioning myself and my decision to um, pursue my career and not come to live in Findo. But now I actually see the full picture and I see why that decision was made, because I feel that now I can offer something back to Findon. So I came back to Findon really in 2009. I was already here and founded my theater company in a little office uh, in the Universal Hall, which is the theater that is set in our community in the eco village here. And then I started producing plays from Findon and bring them to Italy. And I was targeting teenagers. Uh, I really always been working with young people. I love, I, I found that that is fundamental for humanity to focus on youth at the moment. And I was doing it with my play. Uh, but at the same time, I really felt that the the learning that I received uh, in Findon were feeding a lot of my play and uh, and especially my longing for a new form of theater that could somehow restore uh, theater as culture, as you say, as a as a way to gather again as humans around the fire, maybe now a virtual fire, sometimes safer, which is a virtual fire, depending on the place. But, you know, gathering, the gathering together to learn together through a collective experience. And that was uh, something that always intrigued me. And that's the reason why I continue with the theater and uh, and then uh, after a few years um, staying between Edinburgh and here, I decided to move completely here, uh, come back to Findon, and that was to, uh, 2018. After one of the, my crises, I regularly have, I would say not regularly, but in cycle have crisis, saying, I know what I want to do. I was in a workshop here and said, I know what I want to do. I want to do something called sacred theater, but I don't have a clue what it means. And so I started exploring what it meant. 
and I went to Catalonia. I I um, did a training, a year training in uh, in spiritual and nature nature based practices. So I um, I started to uh, use theater to fulfill a need that I could see in the teenagers and I could see here in Findor, which was, you know, helping out with the separation that I could perceive in, among communities and not just humans, but also the other than human communities, if you want to call it that way, or nature. And so during lockdown, uh, especially, I was fully here during lockdown and I actually uh, it, made, it meant a lot to me because I conceived my, you know, my new step. You know, the, the secret theater I was talking about became something clear and is now called the theater of the seven directions. And I started to um, use what I'm good at to serve my community, which is a call that I feel and uh, using theater. My mission is to support people to awake their potentials and to uh, make threads and uh, connect uh, mm -hmm. between each other and with nature. And I use it, uh, first of all, with the, the figure of the town crier, I became the town crier of the community. And then I developed a series of different plays um, and uh, different- Yeah, just let me pause there. Like, because now you're now you're going into uh, not only what is your passion, but how it's starting to manifest. But I just would like to pause a moment because I'm very intrigued that um, what you have discovered through the sacred theater and now theater of the seven directions. I love those names. Can you tell us what the seven directions are? Yes, the seven directions are north, south, east, west, above below and center and center okay beautiful so you know some of the people that i work with um including those in media they're, they're always interested in what's the tension between individual agency and sort of collective connection or responsibility can you say a little bit more about um how you've woven that into your work because it sounds to me like this is something you've been aware of and even those seven directions seem to me to really encompass both individual agency and collective embrace would that be true yes it is true i i just felt that um uh, the the separation that we feel you know let's call it the climate crisis or the ecological crisis to use a better term that is affecting the world right now is not happening only outside in nature what is the outside part of us what i call it you know, the outside part of us, but also inside. We are living an ecological crisis, not knowing anymore our purpose or what we're here for. And uh, although we live in communities, in villages, in towns, very often we feel isolated and separated. And I really felt mm -hmm. that individually, we have a lot of amazing qualities and skills, but when we are together, what prevail is the egotistic aspect of, of us. And I was intrigued to, to find ways where this can somehow mm, become in the background and uh, our needs or our, our longing and, and how our heart can become more visible to others. And, uh, and then we can develop a collective uh, soul or a collective purpose even and I noticed how theater does that it's always been doing this uh, first of all when you create a theater company you create a community and uh, and you explore all the aspects all the facets of uh, of uh, the human identity and as an actor as a performer I think is a better term as a performer um, you explore every everything even the shadow even the parts that we don't embrace usually we don't embrace it in ourselves and when we see it in others is even worse so what i noticed when i started to um, offer some workshops and some experiment experiments with people was that uh, through the shield of 
the character, people were able to really engage with the shadow in themselves and to make it a resource and to use the collective to uh, see their potentials and uh, implement their potentials. So I, I actually thought, hang on a minute, maybe this can happen also in different contexts. And how can I use the creative context to, you know, this is the base of the creative process. So I just thought maybe we have to really bring theater, not just to professional art actors, but to anyone, any individuals that would like to live life on a quest. And that's the reason why I called my performers questers. Uh, quest for me is a, uh, um, a way that we should face life with curiosity to know, to see, to learn from each other and from ourselves. So through theater, I noticed that people engaged with each other and started to really have a collective consciousness. So I am, I've developed even more and I started to really use theater and uh, the practice of uh, theater to uh, to support individuals to become part of a collective. Oh, it's fascinating. It's beautiful because, you know, um, studying traditional theater, you know, I think a, an actor has to learn lines and enter into the character that either the author created or the director wants to bring out. But what I hear you talking about is um, somebody who's discovering the, what they have to say in themselves. Um, and is that how you develop your your scripts? Are they being co-developed with your questers? It's not you coming in and, and delivering something top down or just on a page. Can you say, yes. is, am I understanding that right? Yes, exactly. I, I feel that, um, you know, developing the, the part of devising has to be a, a, a process, a collective process again with the, uh, with the questers. Uh, which they are improvising on themes that I bring in. Uh -huh. on, uh, I bring the themes, I bring some of the subject, and then I usually ask them to improvise around. And um, we come up with a draft script and we try it out. Sometimes I ask them to write uh, their own piece, for example, for the play that I created for uh, um, the beginning of our um, 60th birthday celebrations in which we had it in March, uh, the Red Ball, I asked them to write their own monologue. Uh -huh. And then I took the monologues and obviously I reshuffled them, I changed them, I shaped them, I, I, I put other things in, but I used them as a skeleton for their personality, for their character. And um, I really do believe that uh, at the moment, this kind of work is uh, much more uh, needed than uh, the work of the professionals in terms of um, awakening a consciousness. Yeah. Um, and so I think that in community, it, it works very well. And the seven directions which are corresponding to the development of the human identity according to the seasons and to, and to the and to the direction uh, the directions uh, is a way to um, uh, re restore um, a kind of deep connection with what what we are mm -hmm. we are part of nature so we we develop with nature and in nature we can find a lot of answers and yeah. so even the, the building of the characters or the building of the scene, it's really looking <clears throat> into the directions. And yeah. the audience is part of the process too. Yeah, so I've noticed that. So one of the first things that I saw that you did um, after we started to have the lockdown in uh, Fintorn, which I think surprised everyone, um, I don't think any of us anticipated that we would have to cope with something like a pandemic or horror of horrors that we ourselves would be locked down and, and have to go into some kind of isolation. And it was much stricter at the beginning than gradually as, as, as the uh, course of the pandemic played out. But you created something called the town criers. Now, 
I don't know if people even remember from reading history what they think of as a town crier, but what was your idea and what happened here? It was, it really became quite a, a series of experiences. But what, tell us about the town crier. The town crier came exactly as, as a response to, to something that was happening. We were in lockdown and people were isolated and we thought it would have been really nice to try to keep a connection and um, communication with people that were in their own house, especially people that were on their own. And not everybody likes to, to, uh, to be online um, all the time. So we felt that we needed something to boost the energy, to, to, to hold, to you know, help people to hold on basically. And at the time we were having some, we created a group that it was going to VAG, Volunteering Action Group to help out. And I was part of the group and, uh, and I, the idea of the crowd came together with uh, our, um, our listener conveners at the time, Lorraine, uh, we were talking about, you know, how can we pass news and tell news to people in the different quarters of our eco-village um, without being invasive, but actually being somebody that bring also the good news, not just the bad news. You know, how, what can we do to do that? And at the same time, pass basic information like stay home, how to reach the shop, what timetable was the shop, you know, who could bring your shopping if you need, you know, just basic logistic information. And the idea of the town crier came up because um, that was a really, you know, old uh, uh, figure in uh, in towns and villages uh, where the this town crier uh, with a bell and with a, a, a paper a roll of paper was going around and um, announced uh, what was happening in the town, saying what was going on in the town, uh, like in a live newspaper somehow. And, uh, and so I started it with a bicycle to go around the, the, the quarter. I started on my own. Then I connected with other people and a couple of uh, people responded to my appeal. Good friends, uh, uh, Annie and Roy. And we started uh, going around uh, twice a week. I don't believe it. I did it twice a week <laughs> on Monday, on Tuesday and Friday. We were going in any kind of weather. Uh, and I was doing it twice a week and any one week and Roy, uh, any on a Tuesday and Roy on a Friday. We were going around and we were bringing news and we were finishing always with a moment of entertainment. A song that people could uh, sing with us, a little dance, a little sketch, something to cheer people up. And it was an amazing experience because I managed to really... Um, getting to know the quarters. I could even now really sense the difference of each quarter. Uh, it was just really different, different way to, to relate, the different personality of the, of the quarter itself, you know, the neighborhood. And um, we developed a beautiful connection and it was so touching to see some people coming out with their chair on the street looking at the watch if we were late, you know, and just say, hey, you're late today. And enjoying that 10 minutes, really, of, and you know, see, sometimes silly, sometimes poetic, sometimes meaningful, so always meaningful, I think. But, you know, a moment to share a smile and at the same time try to, to hold on to what is important, be together, stay together, uh, respect each other, be grateful, be grateful of the fact that we, we live in an eco village and we are not stuck in a, you know, I don't, I don't know many stores building, you know, uh, we are in, in the middle of nature. So amazing experience, really. It, it was amazing. And um, how, how many neighborhoods, I, I mean, I asked you this question when I was beginning to see you come around a couple of weeks um, and I realized how many stops do you take? Do you remember what you told me? Heather? I think it was 11, something well, like that. I think you told me 12. Yeah, so 11 or 12. 12 times 10 minutes times twice a week, and you were doing all of those. Just amazing. Yes, and then we cut one, exactly. There was 12, and then we cut to 11 because there was not enough people on that one, but they complained. The two <laughs> people that were coming, they complained. But yes, it was it was quite long, um, actually. It was a couple, it was at least two hours uh, yeah. around. 
Right. In all kinds of weather, as you said. In every yes. kind of weather. So yes. And yeah. what was your what was your tagline? What was the, the always remember? Allow yourself to be infected by and the community responded, love. love. Allow yes. yourself to be infected by love. Yes. yes. It's such a beautiful line. And I have shared it around the world because I thought it was very infectious myself. It is, it is. I think I'm going to make the t-shirts sooner or later. Because yes. You should yes. all wear it. It's just such, yes. such a great reminder for us. Yeah. So the other things that you were doing uh, in between the town criers was you created the artist hunt. You want to tell the audience what those involved and um, how did you manage to weave those in as a kind of, would you call it an installation theater? Yes, I think it's a good idea to call it installation theater. Thank you, Marilyn, for the suggestion. I never know how to describe the artist hunt. Also, the artist hunt was a, was a community response to the lockdown. Uh, we could go out, but not in good, in big cohort. Only, you know, there was, um, um, you know, three households at the beginning, but then six or whatever. I don't remember exactly. But the idea was to make a performance that people could watch without assembly in a gathering so we thought what about if the people have to walk around i thought this is a good idea i i ask some artists to uh, just hide in different parts of the eco village people had a map they can walk around and every uh, performance lasted no more than three minutes. This is for allowing people to continue walking. So there was no gathering and, um, and people could enjoy almost an hour of entertainment and uh, without breaking any rules and also going home with a smile and, and receiving some, some, some inspiration. And uh, we did it now few times and it's become quite a classic of our community and we do it for the children at Christmas and uh, with Santa of course is one of the main uh, guests and we are going to do it again uh, for the Findorn Bay Arts and part of our 60th anniversary celebration next October so we are doing it a uh, few times and and the artists are uh, people that live in our community that they have talents and again, um, you know, performers that are connected with, to the community and they can share and they can offer something. And it's a lovely opportunity to do that. What kind of artists uh, were involved just so that our audience who isn't in Fintor knows? Yes, they could be dancer, they could be uh, singers, uh, they could be storytellers. We, are, we have amazing storytellers here or poets and they can read their own poems or they can read a very beautiful poem that they found interesting for them, inspiring for them. Um, and then uh, people who play instruments participate as well. So, you know, comedy, little sketch of comedies. So that was another one, uh, another idea of, uh, you know, uh, bringing people together and uh, and uh, let them have, you know, reflected back the, the beauty of being together. Uh, when I remember the first one, I think you had the artist move around and we could stay in, in locations and then you switched it so that you put them into places um, where no not exactly there was a carousel that we did it for easter oh, we okay decided, we decided at easter that it was better to uh do it in a different way uh so people stayed in their location in their quarter and the artists moved around like a carousel so we had that opportunity with the um, uh, lovely rabbits uh, yes, yeah, I remember the rabbit. I remember the rabbit because I have a picture of me holding a rabbit up as well. <laughs> so yeah, the so, rabbit so, thing, yeah. So the carousel was where the artists moved around, but I think the most popular has been where you install the artists and people move around because yeah. they also get some exercise at the same yes. time. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's something that um, is continuing with it, uh, uh, an active life. You've mentioned the red ball. And this was a full performance. And you started by talking about how you invited your questers to create their own monologue. Um, and I remember talking to some of them who were doing the rehearsals. 
tell us a little bit about the cycle of that because I think if I'm remembering correctly, it took you three times to actually get the performance live. You had scheduled it two times and because of the intersection of COVID, you had to reschedule and, and I think you managed to change it a little bit every time. So give us a little history of the red ball. Give us a description of, of what it is, first of all, and then uh, how, what happened with it? Yes, the red ball um, was a, a really a responding to, again, um, maybe more consciously and more openly to the community, responding to a moment of crisis that we were living, not only in the world, but in our community as well. Uh, we've been uh, affected by a, 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 some pain uh, that came because uh, uh, somebody set on fire our community center and our sanctuary. And so we were grieving and it was a very difficult time. And uh, the mo obviously the fire brought up as usual, the fire, uh, the fire does a lot of uh, pain and grief that was uh, probably hidden or have been hidden for a long time. So it wasn't just about this grieving of losing the century and the community center, but there was more grieving about the changes in the community, the difficulties we were experiencing as a community in the world at this time. Uh, as individuals in a community that is uh, was developing, changing, transforming into something else which we don't know what it is yet. So it was quite scary. And, uh, and the community was in a, in, a, in a difficult time, in a difficult space. So I want to create a play that could respond to that and give some food for thought, some inspiration, some reflections. And I, um, I then I called out, uh, first of all, as usual, I called out like a, a course a group of people that could join in a kind of a training, which I offer. And uh, because the way I work could be quite uh, hard for some people. I I really rarely give tea breaks, which is quite, <laughs> it's quite a problem here in Findon. And uh, I, you know, yeah, the timetable, I usually work for quite a few hours intensive. So it, it was a quite a tough call. And I had a, you know, some of my uh, usual actors, your usual questers, people that have already done some work with me, and then some new people. And so we started uh, together by, you know, reflecting upon the crisis. And I asked them to, uh, you know, to improvise around another story. And this is what the beauty of theater. You don't have to go straight into the into your own pain. You say you, you can use another metaphorical pain to embrace and hold your own pain in that. And so we thought of another community called the Red Bull community. And the Red Bull community is very happy, everything is rosy. But at one one day, something happens. The red ball, which is really a real red ball in, in the middle of the community gets stolen, it disappears, and they don't find it anymore. So they go into a big crisis. The Red Bull gives the name to the community, the Red Bull, and it represents many things, it's a symbol for many things. So now that they don't have the Red Bull, a lot of things that have been unsaid and unfinished come to the surface, and they have to face it. So the community, started to go into a crisis. They start to turn into each other. There is a lot of judgment, mistrust, betrayal, fear. And while they are in this state, uh, this small community, and they, they decide they need new members to join the community so that they can find the money to buy a new ball or to build a new ball. And so they found, they sent flyers around and two new members arrive, which they are guilt and memory but it's a very different kind of memory because memory lost her memory. So she is in a very difficult state and guilt of course is guilt. So this new new character into the community started to deteriorate very easily. The, co the connections, the relationships, everything deteriorates uh, to the po point that they are arguing openly again. And, um, I think that the scene uh, has been represented by people 
um, throwing out from their pockets and their raincoats a lot of rubbish, plastic. So we fill the stage with plastic and we insult each other. Basically, we shout at each other. That was a very difficult scene to do because the quester didn't want to do it at the very beginning. They found it, they, yeah, I mean, first of all, they said, we are not angry. And then they, and then when they finally found the meaning of, of the scene and they took it out, then they realized how important it was to embrace something that it was bigger than themselves. Uh, you know, it's not about individuals. When you do a theatrical piece, it's about the collective always. So you are a channel or a vessel. And so they were a vessel for something bigger. So they were channeling and uh, mirroring the anger and the frustration and the judgmental attitude that we have in the world, not just in una, one community, but in everywhere, really. So that's the story of the community. And then there is obviously some kind of help that comes. And uh, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna say much because there is a possibility to see online the Red Bull is on Vimeo and, uh, and the, um, the link is free for people to really watch it. And obviously if people want to give a donation for the 60th birthday celebrations, it's great. Um, if not, they can still watch the Red Bull online. So maybe you can have the link if you're interested and see how does it end? That's lovely. It'll give us a bit of suspense and um, I will happily put the link in so that people can follow that. Um, so I was just curious because um, when you had to delay the performance, did the story change? You've outlined some of the tensions that existed in the yeah. story. So, so did it deepen in some ways? It didn't change, but it deepened a lot. Uh, I think that I actually wrote the monologues um, in in December and January. I write the, the monologues for each of them. The final, you know, they have a monologue. There is a scene where everybody is actually uh, somehow throwing up something that they feel. They are stuck in the throat. It's finally coming out. So they were quite delicate monologues to write. And then they needed to sediment. They needed to sink. And um, and then we had COVID. I got COVID, another member got COVID and we had to cancel and postpone second time again, COVID and we had to stop. And, I, and the second time we were, we were very discouraged and the youngest member of our community who is 11 years old, uh, came to me when just, he just heard we had to cancel it again. And I was really in pain. And he looked at me and said, Laura, they are not ready the community is not ready yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so interesting what uh, he opened with that comment for me. And yes, I think that we weren't ready, the community wasn't ready, and the right time came when we did it, which was March. We needed more time, and the community needed more time, because I think the play was carrying very, you know, delicate issues, and uh, and uh, it wasn't an easy uh, piece, of, uh, piece to watch. You no. needed be ready and we needed to handle it with care so we needed more time yes that's beautiful and uh, without giving anything away can you remark about how you managed to do something I think that is a very Laura way of incorporating in your performance multiple landscapes you moved it from yeah. more contained in our universal hall uh, and the whole audience had to get up and move to, can you say a little bit about where you moved it to and how did, that was magic as far as I was concerned. How did you do that? Um, it was really important that um, there was, um, the, the, you know, for me, the exploration of this play as it wasn't just a piece of entertainment, but it was a, somehow a ceremony. I just thought I needed to incorporate some kind of ritual or ritualistic movement uh, for the audience and the performance as well together. And so I decided that um, it was important to move out because there is a very important phrase that at one point I said in the in the play. Uh, you know, the one of you know the, one of the characters say, says says um, uh, it's time to go. You need to go. And another character says where. 
out of pain, out of the pain. And that was a message that I wanted to send out and uh, me together with the cast, we wanted to send out, it's time to get out of the pain. It's important to grieve, but it's also important to move out. And we moved out together as a community from the Universal Hall in silence. We did a procession, we pro proceed together in procession to where the place where the CC, our community center was built. And obviously there was nothing there, uh, but we created the final scene there where everybody could witness something that I call the rebirth, the wish or the blessing of the rebirth. And uh, the children of our community were involved in this. And I think that that was fundamental. I, I think that was the most important part for me of the play, putting there that rich, rich, ritualistic uh, moment and that ceremony to move consciousness from, uh, from the pain into the new, into the future, into what we could realize, into the dream of the future, so that, you know, it's not there yet. And it was important to do it together so that we could dream together. And um, that was the message that we wanted to, to bring to the audience. Beautiful. Thank you so much. That was a very special evening for me. Yeah, I remember it very, very well. So we'll tantalize our audience to go watch that, that uh, film and video. And I know that was something extra that you took trouble to do, was not to just have the live performance, but to have it also filmed so that it could be experienced and appreciated by others, both who were there and who weren't there. Yeah, so thank you. It also, I just mentioned how you have multiple landscapes in your performances. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing in the dunes? Because I think you've taken plays out right into nature itself. And uh, again, give us a little bit of a background about how you started to experiment with that and the last time that you've done that. Um, I've done this, I started, I think the first time I did a procession and we went also in the June was during the uh, um, uh, consciousness uh, 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 conference. We did a conference here, here. Uh, I don't remember what year, was it 2018, I think? Was that climate, like climate, con uh, climate, climate and change and yeah. consciousness, exactly. Yeah. I think it was yeah. 2017, actually. Yes. 2017. Um, so I created a procession. I really do believe that this is like a, an important uh, form of theatre to move. And we were moving into dunes and there were performances all over in the dunes, in the woods, and people were actually processing all the way uh, in a circle following the seven direct, following the four directions on a plane of the four direction and with the performers on inside themselves on a vertical line above and below, which is what uh, theater usually provoke. And, uh, and so we, we did that for the first time. And then I decided to do more experiments uh, with that um, and uh, to, um, to, to, to create performances where the audience can, uh, together with the, with the questers, can become closer to nature find a way to get closer to nature. So during lockdown, again, I developed a, um, a, a way of working uh, online that I called Theatre Solo Journey. And the Theatre Solo Journey um, culminated in a performance. Uh, people were uh, exploring by themselves on a series of one-to-one -one sessions, the development of their own monologue. And at the end of that, uh, we went into the dunes, we went into the woods, actually, where the hinterland, which is, we have a, a part of, uh, of our community um, um, where we could, we could gather together there, and they perform their monologues. And then it was a very touching moment for them to be able to set their monologue in nature finding the right location for them and exploring how the character connected with, with nature and how nature was supporting that process. So it was quite special. 
And then again, I did more work uh, with the teenagers recently, uh, where I asked them to move around uh, and to create a, a kind of procession, although that was really devised by them. I had a group of 16 people came in, the majority from Italy and some locals. A majority were teenagers between 15 and 20 years old. And uh, they, uh, in, a, in a period of 10 days, uh, devised a piece, um, taking our community on a journey to um, create connections, make connections. And there, again, we were moving around because the spirit of the places somehow helps us to reconnect with nature. And it's very important to use um, uh, the places as a kind of a portal to to access our maybe our ancestors or maybe you know the uh, kind of memory that we hold inside ourselves of our connection with the the other than human world. Mm, beautiful, so rich. It's just so rich. I'm I'm delighted. I could listen to you for hours and hours. Uh, but I would like to know, you, you seem to really appreciate um, the depth that this impacts the questers who work with you. Um, how about yourself? How are you impacted by what they do? It is my, it is my, my journey of growth through them. I mean, I'm privileged to, to have this incredible um, uh, I would say pool of teachers. They they show me, they show me so much. I learned so much from what they propose, from their generosity, from their questions, from their annoyment sometimes, you know. I, I really learned so much. And um you know, I, I'm really always struck by their trust. You know, they trust me incredibly. They they open up. You know, you need to be to need to trust in this kind of work. You need to completely trust, otherwise you don't do anything. And they trust me completely, and um, I'm really touched by that. I wouldn't be able to to do anything. And all the uh, understanding that I gain make me. Uh, I hope it make me a better artist and a better coach. And I can I can create more experiences for people. What I'm I'm really interested in is to help people to uh, awake their potentials. That's for me is very important. When when people come out and they really embrace who they are and they feel re empowered, um, I I'm so happy. That is what I I love. I love doing that. And it's just for that, I'll do it forever, really. It sounds like it's very personally rewarding for you, but could you say something about how you think this might be a way that culture has a power to change the world for good? I do believe that uh, there is a lot of possibility that culture uh, can help uh, us to awake and to find the courage, the inspiration the willingness you know the there is a, a scholar which i'm following at the moment i'm writing my dissertation called freya matthews she talks about um uh this uh, figure that she invented called the animator animator and the animator is the awakener of the creative and poetic potentials of the world the one who is capable of calling humanity into presence in this moment of the ecological crisis. And what she says is that we spent a lot of time, uh, you, know, you know, scientists and philosophers, eco-philosophers and eco-psychologists are talking and, you know, we, we say a lot, of, we know everything we need to know about the ecological crisis, but nothing changes. And it might be that now is the time that we actually turn into turn to culture, turn to the arts, and we all embrace that. So th we don't have anymore the 
professionals, which they are the ones doing it, but we embrace it. So that's the reason I love using people that are not using is not the right world, but you know, make them as instrument, make them do and become the artists that are awakening something, who are awakening something for our community. We don't need the professionals, we need the heart, we need the purpose. And we need people that really appreciate the, the culture that arise from uh, traditions, from, uh, you know, artistic development, uh, from, uh, you know, uh, the, the young people that are creating something new. We, we need to, to really become creative and use creativity for me to be able to help each other. And, um, and I do believe that uh, uh, as a collective, we have a mission to do this as humans, as humans. It's our contribution is the culture, but it's not the culture that is said, it's the, the culture that is lived. Mm -hmm. And so, and that is danced and is sung uh, and is told in poetry. That is, uh, you know, we need to pay back to nature by, you know, perform for nature, perform from the other than human and, and say thank you with a little can, -can or a tip tap or something. Oh, that's uh, so beautiful. And it, it, um, it just really brings the whole practice of gratitude into um, and a cultural appreciation. Before we go, is there anything you'd like to say about how you've taken yourself back to school and what you're studying? Yes, I I decided during lockdown uh, to um, to go back to study because I want to develop more terminology and more literature uh, to to talk about the theater of the seven directions and to spread this concept and uh, and apply it to. Uh, the development of the ecological self and to what you know is needed right now in the world and because I've been in the theater for 35 years I thought the ecology was my weakest point so I found this course at Schumacher College um, supported by Plymouth University and is an MA and is called Engaged Ecology and I I took the course and has been a fantastic journey so far. Um, learning how I'm a, I'm a, I'm applying, you know, theater to ecology, and I'm applying ecology to theater, and I'm combining the two. The two, and I found that uh, I'm I'm so happy I, I I'm doing this, and uh, I hope that at the end of it, when I will finish my dissertation at the end of October. I will have uh, all, I will be equipped to spread the voice even more and to offer more work and more uh, possibilities to people. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Laura. And thank you for our whole conversation. I found it inspiring, not only because I think it is such a beautiful amplification of the three principles here at Findhorn. You are truly uh, a model of work is love in action. And your connection with nature, you're obviously co-creating with the intelligences of nature. And just the description of your questing is just a beautiful form of deep inner listening. And I love that you're able to speak to it, not only from the individual questers perspective, but that you see that you're creating the conditions for collective consciousness, which is really something that is so important for the work that I do when I look at cities as whole living systems that are having these interconnected dynamics. And I love that you're able to, for me personally to link this back to my first love of theater. So thank you so much for this conversation. Thank and you. Thank you very much, Marlene, for the opportunity. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Look forward to more conversations. Of course. Thank you for now.